Hi everyone, happy weekend. Um, so this next video and probably the next two are going to be about cognitive development. What is that anyway? Cognition means thinking, reasoning, and remembering. Um, so basically all the thinking that goes on in our heads. And this is where Jean Piaget um, comes into play. And before we were before Piaget, people really just thought that kids were stupid versions of adults, like mini adults. And Piaget decided to sit down and observe what children were actually doing. And this is almost, you could say, a philosophical, a, a philosophical approach to raising children and seeing children because Piaget believed that um, all that children do is important and interesting and the errors they make, the mistakes they make, um, they tell us a lot about where that child is and how that child is learning. And his theory, which unlike Freud, remember Freud had this problem with falsifiability, like you couldn't falsify Freud's theories. It was just kind of this overall theory of a person, but you couldn't prove it either way. Well, Piaget designed so many tasks and used data, um, so he, his theories certainly are falsifiable, um, and but many of them still hold up today. Um, his theory is that children learn differently than adults, and they are developing at these different stages. So what I like about P Piaget's development of his theory is that he found his information from mistakes of children. He was actually working for Alfred Binet, who um, is the guy who ended up inventing one of the major IQ tests that are used, and we'll talk about this later in the cognition unit. But while he was working for Binet, he noticed that children tend to answer questions wrong on tests in similar ways. So instead of determining, oh yeah, kids are just stupid, he decided to look at their errors. And he made this hypothesis uh, that children have different schemas than adults. They, they view the world differently than adults do. So what's a schema? A schema is a conceptual framework used to solve problems. Schemas are the ways that we interpret the world around us. So let's give, I'll give you an example. Picture a model in your head. Maybe you picture someone like this, um, but does that person fit your schema? It's basically a schema is your picture in your head when you think of anything. So Piaget had hypothesized that children have different schemas than adults. They actually have a different conceptual framework for how they view the world than adults do. Here's another example of schema. So uh, we've got two-year-old Gabriella learning the schema for cow. There's a cow from her picture book. And then she sees a moose and remembering that uh, the big animal with four legs is a cow, she calls the moose a cow. She's trying to assimilate this new animal into an existing schema, the schema that she thinks is a cow. But her mom tells her, no, that's not a cow, that's a moose. Um, so Gabriella kind of changes her schema for uh, knowing that a moose is different from a cow. She accommodates her schema for large shaggy animals and continues to modify that schema to include a mommy moose and a baby moose and so forth. So here's a couple really important definitions for you, assimilation and accommodation. So the process of assimilation involves this incorporation, incorporating new experiences in our existing understanding. And once we adjust, that process of adjusting a schema and modifying it is called accommodation. Here's another example. Um, an animal with four legs and a tail is a dog. But what might that child call this or that? And the child using their schema, four legs and a tail, dog, child probably is going to call that cat a dog and that horse a dog. And that's really weird. So again, assimilation in high school. If you see two guys dressed like this, what kind of schema would you assimilate them into? And are you always right? And when you are wrong, you're going to adjust your schema and that's called accommodation. So here's an example of accommodation. Um, us from the Midwest, we might picture Bronx as the ghetto. And actually, the Bronx uh, has some really cool things. Um, very nice neighborhoods. It's actually very expensive to live in most of the, the Bronx. Um, there's this really cool zoo. There's this great park. Um, and again, very different. So 
um, you're kind of forced to accommodate to change your schema to incorporate the new information. All right, so yesterday you learned about the stages of social development, particularly about Erickson, but also remembering Freud's stages of social development. Today is all about cognitive development. So here is Piaget's theories, here are the stages, and then the, the next few minutes I'll be walking you through each stage. Stage number one, sensory motor stage. So babies, between from birth to about two, they experience the world through their senses. And they don't have this concept called object permanence. And here's a real video example for you to see object permanence. Okay. Hey, look, Lucy, look. It's the Clippers. Go get them. So here's our definition of, of object permanence. Objects that are out of sight are also out of mind. You can entertain a baby for a very long time playing these peekaboo games. Now children younger than six months don't have object permanence. It is usually developed by the age of eight months. So though Piaget's research has set a, an outstanding framework for understanding development, there's, there are some more contemporary criticisms of his work. Uh, he really believed that children in the stage could not think, they, and he believed they did not have any abstract concepts or ideas. But recent research has shown um, some differences. And reading number one here, children understand the basic laws of physics. They are amazed at how a ball can stop in midair or disappear. So some clever psychologists have um, shown babies these images of like a ball hanging in the air. And again, just like how you read in your textbook, um, they're calculating this research method is really in look time. How long did a baby look at an image and that the longer the time is showing that children are surprised uh, by that image. And, and infants looked longer when a ball was like suspended in midair, so defying the laws of gravity, or when there is some kind of video where a ball just disappeared. Now here's another very recent example. Addition, math. Um, children, very young children, can count. So a psychologist Dr. Wynn showed that children stared longer at the wrong number of objects than the right ones. Um, look at this experiment. So two objects were placed in a case and then a, stream, a screen comes up and the child sees the hand that's empty go here and remove an object. Now when then shown if the screen drops and just one is left revealing one object um, research has shown that children expect this. This is right. Yet, um, if an impossible outcome happens, the screen drops and somehow two objects are there. So the researchers um, were able to place the object back. They had like a, a an area to, to push the object back from underneath. Um, children were surprised at this uh, outcome, showing that they can count two. They have an expected outcome and the impossible outcome surprise them. So next we have the pre-operational stage, ages two to seven, that's a pretty large gap. And they have object permanence and they begin to use language to represent objects and ideas. And the big thing here is that they're egocentric. They can't look at the world through anyone else's eyes but their own. So here's a really good example of a child in that stage. Tell me what you see when you look at that from where you're sitting. What are some of the things that you see? A cat. Okay, now we're going to do the same thing. Can you tell me what you see when you look at it from that stool? Um, an owl. An owl? What, what, what is that? Um, a goat. A goat? Okay, is there anything else you see? Right there, what is that? A tree. A tree. 
another little tree. And can you tell me what I see when I look at this from where I'm sitting right here? what you see from that side? A box and a phone and a volcano and yeah. a rock and a big backwards. Now, Braxton, can you tell me what I see from where I'm sitting? A bird and a river and a volcano and a horsey and a rock. And a so from that video, it's clear that the child cannot, even though the child knows, the child cannot imagine what the, the experimenter from the other side of that volcano is able to see. The child only can assume that that researcher can see exactly what the child can see. So before Piaget, this would have been just considered a ah, stupid kid. And Piaget developed this theory that this is part of the child's stage. Uh, and the child really wouldn't develop that ability to see something from another's perspective until the child was older, after the age of seven. So another important concept from this stage is the concept of conservation. What is that? So this concept is dealing with liquids. You want to take a look at your handout. I think I laid out a few different conservation tasks for you in that handout. So here's one example. Um, the researcher shows the child these two flasks and that they have water in them. And it appears that these two flasks are equal. Same size, equal amount of water. It's very clear to the child at the beginning of the experiment that this is the same. And then, right in front of the child, the, ex the researcher flips one flask over. So now you see that this one, uh, the water goes up higher. Now the child knows that nothing has changed. Nothing has been added into either of these flasks. Yet, when asked which one has more liquid, most of the time, a child in this stage picks this flask because it's higher than the other flask. So this child has an inability to use a mental operation and understand this conservation of liquid. So there's been some fairly recent research criticizing this stage as well um, and also arguing that perhaps there's some kind of stage division between the age of two and a half and three. Um, Deloach show that children as young as three are able to use mental operations. So the children were shown a model of a dog's hiding place behind the couch. Now a two-year-old could not locate the stuffed dog in an actual room. So they were shown a picture, a model, and then they were asked to go into this actual room and find the hiding dog. But the three-year-olds could. And here's another example of egocentrism. So another important concept is the concept of theory of mind. So although preschoolers are egocentric, they are developing the ability to understand another's mental state when they begin forming this theory of mind. Um, look at this example. This is a very, very famous Baron Cohen study that it actually is still used today. Um, so we have a doll, Sally and Anne, and Sally puts her ball in the red cupboard. Sally goes away. Anne moves the ball to the blue cupboard. Where will Sally look for her ball? Now a typical child, particularly by the age of four or five, will have developed this theory of mind. They will be able to understand another's mental state. However, this particular test has been used to screen children with autism. Autism is a fascinating um, autism is a fascinating syndrome um, because children with autism often develop completely normally and functionally in the areas of physical development, in the areas of of intellectual development, yet this area, and really this might be in the social development side, um, does not develop. A child with autism will go again and again at saying that Sally will look for her ball not in the red cupboard but in the blue cupboard. They have difficulty understanding that Sally's mind differs from their own. I'm going to stop here but I've got another video.